You're listening to Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter. That's me, your naturally platinum blonde pop culture connoisseur. I'm the reality TV junkie, self-improvement addict, and host with only the hottest tea spilled fresh weekly. For more hot takes, go and give me a follow at Just Plain Zach. I always keep it funny and I always keep it cute. And if you're like me and you want to stay up to date with the latest reality tea, just go and give us a follow at No Filter with Zach on the Instagram. Or you can always join our private Facebook group. The link is in the description below. In honor of today's guest, I am sipping some of my housewives watching wine. Today I've got out the I'm ready to mention it all because you know I always do. Snag some of this fizzy housewives inspired rosé for yourself, packing a punch now at 14% alcohol by volume, but still less than a gram of sugar. Head over to nofilterwine.com. That's nofilterwine.com. Okay, everybody, are you ready? She cooks. She decorates. She's the queen of making it nice, but don't make her angry or else she might hit you with the clip. Her new book seems to be doing pretty well, bitch. From the Real Housewives of New York fame, please welcome the author of Make It Nice, Miss Dorinda Medley. Wow, you covered it all there. I like that. And I like the fact that you're young enough to be drinking in the afternoon and still fine. If I drank that in the afternoon, I'd be asleep until tomorrow. Listen, I've had lots of practice. I've had one too many during the day. Now I know when to live it myself and to mix in lots of water. I love this mention it all wine. How great is that? Thank you. I'm going to send you I'll, I'll send you some because we are obsessed with New York is one of our favorites. And you have so many Dorinda-isms that we love, which you covered a lot in this book. And I have to say, this is one of my favorite Bravo books that I've read. Honestly, Dorinda, it's so good. Thank you very much. Well, that's so nice. I wanted it to read like you were having a conversation with me. That's what it feels. It feels like you're, you're doing a storytelling with us. And we're kind of just going through the story of your life chapter by chapter. And it's really... You know, we don't get to, to know many housewives through the show. It's very two dimensional. We only get like one edit of several different women. But this really gives us like the backstory and gets us to see the woman that we watch on television now. Well, I said, you know, you get to see the frosting and now I'm showing you the cake. Well, I do Put have that a- on a t-shirt. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, we never needs to go order some of that Dorinda merch that you have. Um, this book, though, was it? cathartic was it painful i mean we really relive your divorce the grieving of richard like what would you say was you know the process like writing making it nice for you make it nice you know different parts different chapters had different um you know meaning and and a different effect i definitely definitely felt like when we were leading up to richard's chapter that i was just dreading it because i i it's funny you know everyone knows the story of Richard and I. And, and of course, by the time you've heard about him, he's he was my husband and had a stepfather, this wonderful man that entered our life. And he was totally restored to everyone. But no one, I never really talked about what that journey was when he was departing. And quite frankly, I had never talked about it. And I really, it really was, that was very cathartic. And it made me really proud of the kids, you know, Richard's kids and Hannah for being so strong during that period. Because you know, I always say when, when someone gets sick in your family, the whole family gets sick, yeah. but you're such in panic that you can't take care of anything except this one person. So everybody sort of falls to the wayside and you have to kind of join in together and be tolerant and understand the process. Uh, so that was the hardest part. And I think, but some of the parts were just so like, I really forgot in a lot of ways, how much I loved my grandparents, mm. like I hadn't really thought about them for so long. And yet when writing about them, they were my everything. Like just that excitement. I remember it. Like when I was writing it, I remember so vividly how exciting it would be to get on my spider bike and go see my grandmother. Like, yeah, I forgot that That used to be like an exciting part of the day. I don't know what we did once, once I got there, I think I watched all my children with her, but it was certainly exciting. I'm going to go over to grandma's house, you know, grab a devil dog and watch all my children at general hospital. So all these all these uh, chapters really brought back all these different phases in my life and everybody, all the different people that I've been mm. and all the different things I've experienced and all the different situations I've been put in. And some of them were good and some of them were great decisions and some of them weren't so great decisions. And I just thought it was a, you know, an interesting journey. It's a journey. 
the book I feel like was so well condensed. Do you feel like it was hard squeezing your life down into chapters in a book? Like we get like one chapter of Ralph and one chapter of Richard. And I would yes. imagine, you know. But I, I did that because I didn't want it to be long winded and I didn't want it to be like self-serving. I wanted it to be sort of both in, kind of informative and sort of advice almost like my experience with situations I would love, you know, and that's why I ended each chapter with a little antidote or a little saying, because I thought, well, even if they don't read the chapter, maybe they'll remember what was at the bottom, you know, to kind of lean back into it at some point. Yeah. What do you feel like was the most difficult layer to peel back? Cause you really give like, we get to meet your family in the book. We get to go through all of your different relationships. I loved you talking about your first love, what was the most vulnerable that you maybe, I mean, I know you, Richard was obviously a difficult chapter to to dive into, but was there anything else that you were kind of afraid to reveal? Believe it or not, I was really like, I was really sort of, you know, in my life, I'm sort of Diane Sinclair's daughter. And yeah. I, you know, we're not the type of family that, we, you know, I'm with Hannah. We talked about everything. We were very open about things growing up and that's the world we live in now. But, you know, with my parents, I didn't talk really about anything. You know, I was sort of like, I promise I won't do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everything was no, no, of course I'm not going to do that. And then, you know, with Hannah, I've been mom. So I haven't really you know, discussed a lot of the things that probably were the weaker sides of me as a mother. And I think, um, I think it was probably, I was really tentative about bringing up the the thing about me having an eating disorder for a mm. while and having that body dysmorphia, because I wasn't sure how it received. It was sort of like a kind of a secret that I kept, but I just felt like, you know what? It's okay because I did go through it. It is part of my journey. A lot of people suffer from some form of body dysmorphia and hopefully it'll be received as a learning lesson and not as sort of a fault and I, or a weakness. I loved that because I myself struggled with bulimia really badly for 10 years until I was, I think I was about 22 and I checked myself into a treatment center and like really, like I scared myself to the point where I was like, this is not how I want to live the rest of my life. Well, the thing is about it is it's such a dirty little secret and it's a Mm -hmm. secret so easy to hide, right? And it's such a secret, it's a secret so easy to control because no one can make you eat and no one's with you when you're doing stuff in the bathroom or whatever. And, and the truth of the matter is the results are very pleasing Mm -hmm. when you're in that mindset, right? So it's all this bizarre, there's a shroud of mystery around it and control and, you know, seeing the results and, You really do have to sort of have a moonstruck moment to say, I need to snap myself out of it because what happens with that kind of situation, you think you have control over it and you're very clever and you're getting results. And then all of a sudden it turns its face around and it Mm -hmm. has a control on you. You know, you're in front of it and then all of a sudden it's in front of you. And I think that's, uh, that, that's the lesson there to, you know, watch out for that because I think more people suffer from body dysmorphia than, than, than we can imagine. Even like I was talking to a couple of friends uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, hey, let's go to Soho House in Miami. And the first thing out of every woman's mouth is, oh my God, I got to start a diet immediately. Yeah. You know, we're all just in that Programmed, awareness. Yeah. All the time. It's true. And we don't realize, like, I think especially when things are unpredictable in our lives, like it's harder to control your money. It's harder c- to control your job circumstances. It's harder to control your family. But when you're controlling your body and what, you know, you're putting in it and looking at the weight on the scale, like I became so obsessed with the numbers and I had my day structured around making sure I wasn't around the same people for breakfast and lunch and dinner to make sure I can trick everybody. That, that's what it is. It's a big game. And, and it's, and it's, um, it, and like I said, it's the shroud of mystery and you get so good at it. Mm-hmm. You get so, until my mother, my mother figured it out. And she, I, that was my moonstruck moment. Snap out of it. When my mother's like, okay, we're going to do this because I've got three other kids to raise and a, and a husband to take care of. And if we're going to do all this. You're going away to a hospital. I was like, a hospital. <laughs> I, mean, I was like, I don't want to go to a hospital in Albany. She goes, yep. I don't have time to deal with all this. If you're not going to eat and get it together, you know, I'm, you know, cause my mother's like that. Yeah. She's the most loving mother in the world, but she is no bullshit. You know what I mean? Yep. So I was like, I don't want to go to a hospital at Albany and boy, oh boy, I got myself back on track. And I find the great 
God. Yeah, by the grace of God. And I think we underutilize our own, um, you know, strength to be able to battle something like that. I know for myself, when I was going through it, I was like, you know what, if there's something in me that's driving me to participate in the in this behavior, then there's something equally as strong in me that can fight it. Well, that's right. And also, too, I think it's very personality based. I think it says a lot about, you know, from people that I've spoken to about it and people that have, you know, they tend to be very competitive, sort of like perfectionists. <laughs> yep. You know, want to be on, you know, right? Because it takes that personality that I'm going to beat it. I'm going to beat it. I don't feel pain. I don't feel hungry. And the truth of the matter is, if I were truth with myself, a tiny bit of it always still sits with you. I don't think you ever really get rid of it, it sort of sits. You have it under control, but it, it definitely lies a little dormant. I mean, we've all had our days where we wake up and like, that's it. I'm not eating today. Right. <laughs> yes. I do want to talk a bit about Richard because I, for the first time, really understood your the scene in, in Real Housewives when you and, and Sonia were kind of having an argument over death versus divorce. And I know at the time you got a lot of judgment for that. I just recently went through a really huge loss a few months ago. And for the first time, and we've seen reality stars go through grief and have like moments where they kind of snap because it feels like their grief is not being acknowledged. And so I have to say one, thank you for your courage and your honesty to be that authentic on television and open yourself up to that subject, uh, to that sort of subjectification from the public with dealing with that grief and withholding it, have you learned that it's gotten easier or what advice do you have to people that may be a little newer or fresher in their grief? You know what I think about grief? It's, it, it's like, you know, I think the grief, you know, you're, and, I'm, and you're going to have it. It doesn't go away. It's yeah. not like something goes away. It's not like you, you get, you lost a purse or you've even made a choice in it it sort of stays the same, but you sort of grow bigger around it. Mm. So it's not that the grief goes away, it's just that you build yourself up around it bigger so it doesn't take up so much space as it does in the beginning. And I think if people realize that, it's easier to cope with because it just doesn't go away. I mean, listen, it's Richard's 10-year anniversary this year, and we have a fruit tree, the lonely fruit tree that's left from the original house from 1902, and it Everyone said it was dying two years ago and blah, blah, blah. We have to rip it out. And I was like, you know what? Let's just shock the shit out of it. Fertilize it. Give it another year. And if it comes back, great. If not, we'll take it out. Yeah. But it's the last remnant, you know, last tree, fruit tree here that was actually plant, you know, planted with the house. Well, long behold, it's come back and it's bearing fruit and it's beautiful and it's way down. And I've decided I said to Hannah, let's, since it's Richard's 10 year anniversary, let's decorate a limb of the tree with wind chimes and different baubles and things as a tribute to him. So he always has a place on the property like the fruit tree. And I was putting up the, the uh, baubles, the, <laughs> the baubles the other day. And I just had that moment. I was like, God, I, I miss you. Like, I, I can't believe you've been gone 10 years. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. But you know, it's not like it rules me. But yeah, I was really like, it was like the wind was blowing. And I was like, look at you, you tree. You really <laughs> fought the good battle. You you came back and look how strong you are. And I was like, and I'm you and Richard are going to sit here now and you're going to visit with each other when I'm not here. And I just had that overwhelming, whew, that kind of wind. So you're like, so it doesn't go away. It just, you get bigger than it. And then you, but you carry it with you and it becomes a bizarre gift to, to know that you had the opportunity. I mean, within loss and within grief is the shown ability that you were able to love so much. Yeah. So what a gift is that? It's funny. I find myself more vulnerable, but also stronger and harder at the same time. Like it's this weird juxtaposition of like, you know, I feel like a little more scared of life. But then at the same time, I feel the opposite. And I feel like I want to live my life even more. Like, it's just this weird, like, mind fuck scenario of not understanding, like, the circumstances now. Well, like, I had the game figured out. When, you know, we think we're immortal. I remember right after Richard passed, I was with my mom, who my mom is just, she is the queen of the isms. It's really where everything comes from, Diane Sincala. I call her Buddha in a girdle because she's just such a character. She's never, she's only ever worn a skirt. I've never seen her in a pair of pants, nor do I want to. It would freak me out at this point. Okay. Uh, don't know what's going on between the neck and the knees. 
I'm good not knowing at this point. But she comes up with these hysterical sayings. So I remember after we buried Richard and stuff and we went up to visit him or whatever, I said, oh, such a sh- like it's off it's such a shame the graveyard it's so, like so sad she says what are you talking about we're all going to be here at some point you ain't getting away from it either yeah. i was like oh my god she's right like none of us get away from it. somehow we walk in this world thinking we're immortal it's all yeah. them over there they didn't quite make it right we've got to figure out oh no we're all on the wheel at some point we get plucked and picked Mm-hmm. And I think that's what that does to you when you, you experience it. You're like, this shit's real. Yeah. Like people really die. Yeah. And the, the, it, unexpectedly, I think we all anticipate like, you know, expecting it and, and kind of going through the motions and then you bury the person and then it it's better. And then, you know, you go like a broken leg, you know, you break your leg and you go through the motions and yeah. the leg heals and you run again. And it's not yeah. like that at all. Yeah. So in the no, book- it's I think you know I think you know what you realize, especially when you I'm not that I'm old, but as you get older and I'm dealing, you know, I have parents that are getting older. Right? Yep, life is sort of strange; it becomes a series of losses. Mm-hmm. Isn't that pleasant? <laughs> Thanks, Dorinda. Something to look forward to. Um, in the book, though, I love that you talk about Billy, your first love, which got me thinking of my own Billy and like, do, 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 do. Ha. I haven't yet, but I've thought about it. Um, have you heard from him or some of the other or uh, have you heard from him since the book came out? Did you give him a well, heads up? I, I changed I changed the name to not cause any problems. I'd actually called this person and said, listen, I I'm writing a book and um, it's you know, I'm not going to use your name because I know you're happily married and blah, blah, blah. He goes, oh, I know. I know you're writing a book. I heard. And thank <laughs> you for not using my name because I don't think X would be that happy about it. But yeah, I, I you know, I did. And it's so funny because I had that moment when we were talking again. Now, listen, he's like in his 50s. I haven't spoken to him since I was in my 20s. But all of a sudden I had that little like, oh, maybe I still has a crush on me. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> Oh my God. I love it. Cause you were all young at heart, right? Yeah. What does Ralph think of the book? He hasn't said anything yet. That's interesting. I see. He said, congratulations. Ralph's very British in that way. Ralph's like, congratulations. It's quite, he has a British, Scottish accent. <laughs> I, it's such an achievement for you to have this memoir for our daughter to have and hold for the rest of the years. I mean, that's a, I'm like, okay, okay. Thanks a lot. So yeah, you know what I mean? Was it getting accustomed to the life when you were in Europe? Was that challenging with the cultural differences? I know you talked about how it was challenging to reacclimate into America, but when you first went, when you first left the U.S., how did you kind of navigate? Did you lean on Ralph, or was it a lot more of leaning on your own internal strength? There was no leaning on back then. That's not how it was. It was it wasn't a soft and cozy world like all the young people yeah. have now. It was like get on with it. I landed in Hong Kong and Ralph went to work for 15 hours for Lehman Brothers. That's the way it was. So he gave me a credit card. I had access to, you know, clubs and gyms and I could spend whatever I wanted. But he was like, see ya. You know what I mean? Because he had to work hard. Yeah. He was, you know, Ralph grew up like me and he had this incredible job and the banks really had worked. You I mean, they they paid you well and they, 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 you know, rewarded you well, but they worked you like an animal back then. Cause you remember the investment banks, there were no investment banks abroad. So they were opening up the investment banks and all the giants were there. Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Lehman brothers, um, Solomon brothers. I mean, half of these, I'm showing my age, half of them <laughs> don't even exist anymore. And they were all competing to have the best and the brightest. So it was, you know, and you got to remember, there was no telephones, mm. there was no FaceTime, there was no computer. So you were really like when you left your uh, place in the morning to venture out, you were alone. Yeah. So you had to sort of, you know, I, I remember when I, when I moved to London, I didn't know anybody. And that was, we'd been moving and we moved here and moved there and had a sit in Australia. And then we moved to London and we finally settled, settled. 
And the only person that was my best friend was the person that sold the florist soap at Peter Jones. I mean, I look so forward to going to see him. Oh. I had so much soap and cologne and spray bottles because I just, I just slowly, and I just fixed, you know what I did every day? I try to go out and just meet people yeah. or I would just get involved in anything I could get involved in, go to the gym, go to the Kensington women's club, go to the junior league, just try to find one friend and then one friend turned into two friends. And believe it or not, most of the people in London are still my friend because the thing about London, I was married to a British person. So I wasn't moving back. I wasn't an expat. It wasn't like these people from Exxon or whatever that came for a two year stint. So I kind of focused on meeting more like Europeans and British people. It took me a long time, but once you kind of become friends with them, it's like peeling an onion, you're friends with them forever. Like to this day, I'm still friends with them. It's so hard to make friends like that now because I feel like when we go to the stores or when we go to the markets, like you're on your phone and you're doing other things or you have your headphones in and you're so disconnected from meeting people and getting to know your local grocer. Well, people don't gather the way they do. Yeah. I mean, you know, I remember in London, you could just go to look Caprice for dinner at night and meet people, really meet real people, not pick up people, but yeah. people at the bar and they'd invite you over for a drink. It was very interactive because we didn't have all these other accessories or ways to meet people. So it was yeah. up to you to get up, physically move from your space. I remember Hannah said to me something really interesting. She's like, when you would go out with daddy on Wednesday nights in London to San Lorenzo's, like, and you left me with a babysitter, like, like, how would they get a hold of you? Like, if something happened, I said, I left the number for San Lorenzo. She was really, weren't you scared? I said, well, no one ever called. And you're yeah. here to tell the story. So it's true. It's true. So you mentioned designing clothes for Princess Diana and a lot of my listeners no, want that's not what I did. I didn't design clothes. Now we're going to I love. OK, the so way clarify it, because that's what a lot of the questions are like she knew her. What did she design for her? What was she? What were her favorite I clothes design for her? I, this is like telephone. By the time I'm done, I will be Princess Diana. I was living in Kensington <laughs> Palace with her chumming around, like brushing our teeth together. No, I sold I sold DCL cashmere and I had a really great group of very, you know, well-heeled women that were very connected. And London was very small back then. And we all went to the same gym that we, and we all belonged to the Hurlingham Club and we all went to Annabelle's and we all worked out, you know, down at the same gym. And, you know, I got introduced to her through a friend who said she'd love to buy the cashmere. And she just came one day and bought it. It was really like unbelievable and then I saw her wear it. And that was, that was sort of my encounter. I wasn't good friends with her, but it's so funny. She didn't know who I was because I remember once I was at a luncheon, this is a true story for, it was just when Louis Vuitton was starting the clothing because they didn't really have clothes so much back then. And I was wearing a pink jacket, like a Chanel jacket. And she was wearing a pink Louis Vuitton, I think jacket. And she came up to me. She said, Oh God, there's my doppelganger. I was like, Oh man, I love it. Um, Paula 86 on Instagram wants to know about your time at Buckingham Palace. Why were you there? What's your relationship with the Royal family? Were you dating Prince William? Well, there was no way what they would do. What they would do is they would have garden parties. And if mm. you were lucky enough, you would get invited. They do like these spring garden parties and you would be invited to the garden party, which was quite big. And then I was invited to a couple dinners there for charities that they had actually for like the Prince Philip charity and stuff. And they would have these huge dinners at Buckingham Palace, which was always very exciting to go. I mean, I think I I can count on my hands the amount of times I've been there. But, you know, when you live in London and you've got to remember, we're now talking God, over 20 years ago, it was just smaller and different. And yeah. once you kind of got into the inner sanctum, you just were in, like you would go to Ascot, you'd go to the Hurling Home, you'd go to Queens Club, you'd go to Annabelle's, you'd go to George's, you'd go to Harry's Bar for dinner. It just became your little world, just like the Upper East Side. It just becomes your fishbowl. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if you know five socialites, you know them all. Yeah. Uh, in the book, you also talk, I mean, you t you go through your career history of like Liz Claiborne. You also talk about working in real estate, which I was really fascinated to read because like we didn't know those things about you before. But I'm curious what you think about 
uh, Ramona joining the real estate game? And do you think she has what it takes to tackle this market? I think she'll be good at it. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Because she has a lot of friends, right? And they're all very tight with each other. So I think though, you know, real estate is about being a good salesperson, but it's also about having contacts. And, you know, if you have a good book of contacts and she, God knows she has it, she has all her friends in, in New York. And well, we've seen her lunches with 50 of her best friends. Right. (laughs) So they'll, it'll trickle down. I actually could see Ramona doing real estate. I think she's a good salesperson. Ramona is a business person. I mean, people forget that about Ramona, that Ramona before the housewives ran a very successful business. She did. I mean, and when you have 50 close friends, all you need is one or two of them to buy, to buy. And then, yeah. Correct. So there's one lunch somewhere where they're like, Ramona, I need you to sell my house. Oh my God. You know? And then before you know it, the house is sold. She's got the listing in the book. You talk. So I actually think it's a good choice for her. We'll see how it goes. I'm, I look forward to seeing, you know, just I always love when you kind of see that continuation. Like with Ramona, we saw her kind of go through this character arc. And now she seems to be at a different place in her life. And I mean, if real estate's the way, you know, to go for her, then, you know, all and the she best. she loves the Hamptons. So can't you imagine her in the Hamptons driving around? <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the book, you kind of talked about how when you guys were, knows? it's a continuation. It's a great way to show me the husband too that way. I met my husband go. through real estate. Is that how you, you never know? Oh, that's right. That's how you met Richard. That's how I met Richard. I sold, I sold him. I, I, I got rented him the townhouse and I got a husband and a commission. Can you imagine? I need to join real estate I, I now. Said, I said in the New Yorker when they did my wedding, it was before I realized that they actually write everything you say because I yeah. was just as newly wed in the New Yorker covered our wedding at the um, at the um, what's it called the um, the room at the Four Seasons the Fountain Room, and I remember saying I didn't realize I wasn't savvy to this. I said if I knew then what I knew now, I would have made I would have made Mister Medley get a bigger townhouse, and that was the headline. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you gotta love those reporters. You can look it up. It's in the New Yorker. Look up Dorinda Medley, the New Yorker magazine uh, wedding. That's my headline. If I knew then what I knew now, I would have made Mr. Medley get a bigger. Because I didn't know at the time when I got him the townhouse that he even liked me. He was with a much younger girl. Yeah. He was. I thought he was that guy. I'm like, mm. oh. <laughs> and he didn't. He ended up putting a ring on it. He ended up putting it pretty fast too. So in the book, you talk about how when you guys weren't filming the show, it was kind of like, you know, you would go to camp and you would be fully submersed in it. And then when you weren't taping the show, you kind of were living your own lives. After you were put on pause, did you keep in touch with them? Did you still water those relationships to kind of keep them flourishing? Or did you kind of take a break? I remember, I knew these girls a long, long time. I've known these girls for a very long time. And I think that's the reason why it seems so seamless when I came on, because you'd already seen me in the background. I knew them all. I have history with them. I know their kids. So yeah, of course. And I know not as much because when the girls are filming and when anyone's filming, it's very hard because you're totally immersed in that. And it's what you sleep, drink and eat, you know, and I think it's hard to bring the outside world in because you're, it's hard to go to a dinner on a Saturday night when you're filming, you know, for what, 50 hours a week and talk about and shoot the shit. Yeah. You want to talk about what happened in the scene. And it's so much easier to stay in your little bubble of the housewives. And then when you leave, there is that moment. But it was so I, I remember every year so distinctly, you know, you have this four months of intense filming and there's Ubers and there's food and there's this and you don't pay for anything. And everybody's sending you stuff and it's filming, 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 filming. And you're getting dressed every day and you know, you're worried about what you're going to wear. And then you have the, the final party, you know, the rap party mm-hmm. where they do the final scenes and you literally wake up the next morning and you're like, wait a second, <laughs> where's the people? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're, you're standing in line like Starbucks, like every, ever had an asshole. And they're like, you know, $5 and 45 cents. You're like, wait a second. <laughs> Bravo, check. Because <laughs> it takes a minute to transition back, right? right. Because you've got to don't realize it, that when they rap, everybody disappears. Every cameraman, because you see us with loads of people 
along with that production that you're all involved with, you know, yeah. during the season, you all get really close and then boom, they're gone. So I know you and Bethany got really or seem to be hanging out a lot after the pause was first announced. What how did she kind of help you nav- navigate that time or was she more of just kind of a shoulder to lean on? Bethy's been an incredible friend to me and she's such a smart businesswoman and, you know, someone to look up to. I just, uh, she's very admire- ad- admirable. There's no doubt about that. Are you two still close? I know we saw you on the big shot. You know, I stay close to all the girls. You know, I just, I don't, I'm a bit of a, you know, close to a lot of the girls and I'm close to a lot of the girls in, in the um, other franchises, which I, I, I like, you know, I'm, I'm, I love the girls at Jersey. The other night I went to bookends and at the end of at across the street, Melissa was filming. So I literally went across the street and started filming with Jersey. Literally. I just walked in and they're like, Mike, Oh, man, I love it. Um, I know we have to wrap really soon, but I do have some listener questions. We started a book club as we were reading Make It Nice. So I do want to just throw a couple of these at them at you to bullet point. Um, let's see. Gigi Angelique wants to know if you miss being on Housewives or if you're in a healthier place now. Um, I think you always miss it. You know, mm-hmm. it's part of who you are. You know, I don't as in, you know, you continue on, but you always have a fond place for it. it was, it's a fun thing to do. Gina. You know, I don't think it's probably you're in a better place or a worse place. You're filming. It's reality TV. You have to right. sort of say, you have to call it like you see it or you or don't do it. Right. Um, Gina Nalt in our Facebook group says, one, congrats on the book. And two, wants to know if we'll ever be seeing you back on TV anytime soon. Maybe another show, maybe your own show. You never know. I've been told I'm good TV. So fingers crossed. You never, we got to manifest that. There we go. Putting it out into the universe right now. Um, Storm Doris wants to know what your favorite drink and dish is to serve at a dinner party. Well, my, you know, I just came out with a Bluestone Manor bourbon. So I'm very excited about that. So I've been, it came about during COVID. So I love to drink a little bourbon with uh, some ginger ale and fresh mint with a lot of crushed ice. It's delicious. And of course, I love my martinis. I learned a new trick last night about how to make martinis, which was really interesting. And my favorite dish to serve for big dinner parties, I love to serve my lasagna. It never fails. People mm. love Dorinda Medley's lasagna. It is the best. Um, and Or I love to cook fish. I love a simple fish because you can pre-wrap it. I love to make fish in parchment paper. So you can pre-prepare it and throw it in the oven for the 10 minutes and it doesn't take away from your hosting time with your guests. Mm, I love that. I think a, a, a entertainment book is what you need to write next, Dorinda. Um, last question. This one comes from me. I was right when Airbnb was coming, was putting up Bluestone Manor. I was right there on my computer refreshing, trying to get it. And I missed the booking. Will there be any more opportunities to stay at Bluestone Manor? Well, you know, it's so funny that people just left this morning. So I actually came up and I decided to surprise them. But right before they were leaving, you would have thought a ghost walk in the door. I was like, hello, did you take care of my house? The woman was like this. <laughs> it was so funny. It was so funny. I called ahead to see if I could do it with the concierge. She said, yeah, no problem. Aww. You never know, right? If this would go, I'm thinking a Christmas one. I think there should be a whole Christmas Airbnb where I actually stay. Mm, that would be fun. I would pay for that. <laughs> you can take all my money for that one. Um, well, thank you so much, Dorinda. Everyone needs to go and buy your book. Make it nice on sale right and the now. Audible's in my voice, if that makes any. Difference. Yes, I have a friend I was texting with about the book yesterday, and she was saying that the audiobook was great because, like I said, when you read it, it feels like you're telling us a story. But when we hear your voice telling us the story, it's a whole different experience. So you're in the room with me. Thank you so much, Dorinda. I really appreciate it's your time. Joy. Thank you so much. And I love your hair. Thank you. Make it nice. Mm, thank you guys for listening to Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter. That's me. You can give me a follow at Just Plain Zach or follow the podcast at No Filter with Zach. We go live every Thursday and we'll be live this Thursday. We're also live every Tuesday currently as we're doing our book club with Dorinda Medley's book the next three weeks. We did the first three chapters this week and then we'll do the next three chapters and then the next three chapters every Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. Pacific, 9.30 Eastern, which is the same time we go live on Instagram every Thursday night and you guys asked for it. So I'm going to be uploading the Thursday live.
lives. So join in on the conversation. Ask me your questions. It's more of just like an informal shooting the shit and drinking wine. I actually got in a lot of trouble with last week's uh, with last week's Instagram live. So we'll see how this week goes. I'll see. I'll talk to you guys this Thursday. But give me a follow at Just Plain Zach. Follow at No Filter with Zach. Get some Housewives watching wine. It is available right now. We have the new Potomac cans that are in purple that say drag me. I dare you around for a limited time. They are selling out really, really fast. So if you haven't done so yet, they're only around while supplies last. So you're going to want to stock up for the rest of the season of Potomac, which has been getting really good. I was like Giselle and and uh, Karen going at it. And now we have Giselle and Wendy going at it. And I'm like, oof, I need some more no filter wine for this one. Thank you guys for listening to Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter. Love you guys. I will talk to you next week or I'll talk to you this Thursday. Okay. Love you. Bye.